Okay, uh, I'm gonna go quickly through this slide. This is just an overview. Uh, I would like to discuss quickly the approach we are using to connect Python with uh, with a Then uh, uh, discussion about the YAML and the CDF, the, the, the advantages and the disadvantages. And in the last part, I would like to discuss some of the technical problems we encountered in high throughput and automatic calculations. Okay, uh, uh, first of all, what do we need to automate calculation? As I discussed in my first talk, we need the tools to parse and analyze the output results, so the main output file in text format on SCDF. We also need a programmatic interface to generate automatically input files and good settings, depending on the context, depending on the kind of physical properties we are interested in. Uh, we also need high-level logic to implement the complicated uh, steps in, uh, required to implement modern ab initio workflows that go beyond uh, uh, ground state properties. Uh, and with this high level logic that is in, usually implemented in Python, we can expose task parallelism, so we can split uh, independent parts of the workflow to take advantage of uh, uh, parallelism. Uh, we can also handle uh, runtime errors and try to fix calculations at uh, runtime. And last but not least, we also need some kind of interface with a, a database in which we store the final results or from which we fetch data that can be used to restart uh, other workflows for other physical properties. Uh, just a few words about the workflow infrastructure. There are two different approaches. The first one is implemented in ABPI. I call it FlowTK because it's the name of the, the module. Uh, and it's a lightweight implementation in the sense that it doesn't require uh, uh, external dependencies other than uh, the PyMagen or the standard libraries that we use uh, uh, in, in, in ABPI. This is because the database is replaced, replaced by Pickle that is implemented by the, the Python standard library. And I use this approach a lot when I debug, when I implement new features in Fortran, so I want to validate my new implementation. So it's a very, let's say, lightweight and uh, quick tool for prototyping and testing. But if you are interested in a large scale application, I throw put, uh, we have implemented uh, uh, another package based on uh, Fireworks and obviously ABPI in uh, PyMagen that uses a MongoDB database for data persistent because obviously when you go high throughput you need a database to store uh, the intermediate uh, results. Then Widow is going to present some results about his uh, high throughput applications in the next talk. Both approaches share the same code base, the same toolkit, the same machinery to generate input files, uh, uh, submit calculation, or handle uh, runtime errors. It's just the high-level logic that changes depending on the, on the context. Uh, main features of the workflows, it is available in both approaches. Uh, we have factory functions to generate automatically uh, workflows for uh, typical calculations, and uh, we go uh, beyond the ground state, supporting the FPT, many body. And we're also working on electron phono part. Uh, we support uh, different resource managers because obviously these calculations are executed on uh, supercomputing centers. Each supercomputing center has its own resource manager, and we need a programmatic interface to change at runtime the number of processes uh, or the resources, the memory that we uh, need or the, the, the time limit. And with, with Python, uh, we can play with these parameters at runtime if we have to, we need to fix some problem. Uh, it's also possible to parallelize automatically the calculation. Uh, there's an interplay between uh, Python and Abinit because ABPI calls uh, Abinit in auto parallel mode and receives some uh, configurations and filter the most, uh, uh, let's say, uh, promising ones. Uh, iterative algorithms are automatically restarted by a framework, and this is a typical example in which you have a ground state calculation. The code uh, issues a writes a warning in the log file. Python detects this warning, so we, sh we should not continue with the calculation, but we should restart it. And there's some logic that creates links and restart uh, the, the ground state part in place until w we are converged, then we can continue with the next step of the workflow with the converged density. Uh, okay, a few words about the Abinit input. I already showed some slides the first day, so I'm not gonna go into details here, but it's essentially a dictionary storing Abinit variables and provides methods to set multiple variables with uh, 
uh, easy to use interface. Um, and once you have an ability input that you can create by just specifying uh, the path to a pseudo potential and the file uh, the, that provides a structure, or you can even pass the dictionary with all the parameters and atom uh, are printed that ability uses to specify the, the geometry. Once you have this uh, object here, you can start to invoke directly ability to get important quantities. Okay, this is just a, a quick example of the API. Uh, the input is a dictionary-like, so you set the variables with this syntax. You can check whether the variable is inside the dictionary. You can set multiple variables in one call with this uh, uh, method, or alternatively, there are meta methods in which you just say, specify the number of key points, uh, the number of divisions for the smallest segment of the, the Brillouin zone, and the code automatically finds uh, uh, the la set of shifts and the number of divisions because the input knows the structure uh, associated to the, the calculation. Uh, okay, so once we have an abinit input, we can call directly abinit. All the methods uh, that invoke the, the Fortran code start with abi followed by a, a get. And this approach can be used uh, on your laptop with a shell. Or alternatively, you can use it on the supercomputing centers because the configuration options are specified in a, a YAML file. This is an example I use on my laptop uh, in which I have to specify the kind of resource manager queue, I say shell, so I don't submit with Sloom, but I just run interactively inside the terminal. I set some uh, uh, environment variables so that I can find the location of the Abinit executable at runtime and other parameters, but they're not very important except for this one that defines the maximum number of uh, cores that I can use on my laptop. There are other examples for uh, clusters available at uh, that URL. And these are the modifications you need to run on a Sloom-based uh, machine. Again, we have some information about the hardware, the modules that we have to load, some shell command to enlarge the stack size before running. And here, this, this, I have the options associated to Sloom. So I want to run on this resource manager, on this queue, I have this time limit. I want to have calculations running uh, between, with a number of processors that is between 1 and 48, so I start to put some uh, limits. This is the minimum memory, maximum memory. So this is something that changes depending on the supercomputing center, the, the, the queue and the policy uh, implemented on that particular uh, machine. And here you customize the behavior. And uh, once you have defined your manager, you can start to run. Uh, uh, calculation uh, or submitting calculation and here these are, these are examples in which I created an input file and then I call a binit but just to get some uh, important quantities that will be used to generate workflows. For example, uh, one of the most important dimension is the number of key points and once I have this list of key points then I can perform some kind of post-processing and prepare the other steps of the calculation. Uh, this is very important because obviously all the ab initial stuff is performed with in Fortran by ABPI, so uh, by Abinit, sorry. So we have to, to be consistent. I might call SPG lib to get the space group or the list of key points, but then if I have a mismatch between the ABZ of uh, SPG lib and the, 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 the list of key points that are, that are, um, found by Abinit, well, the calculation very likely crash or produce uh, unphysical results. So we decide to use this approach. Uh, it's also possible to select the most important configurations for the parallelism by just calling this method. You yeah, specify the maximum number of processors, and then I have some logic that sorts the configurations by efficiency or by speed up, and there are options that you can specify in the manager to uh, select the criterion. You can sort by efficiency, by speed up, or you can enforce additional constraints. You can have clusters in which you have to allocate full nodes, for example. Uh, another important part is the API that allows you to call the DFPT part to get the list of Q points in the ABG, the list of uh, irreducible perturbations. And this API was uh, crucial for the Phonon, the, the DevRoot project uh, uh, related to Phonons because it allows us to um, split uh, this big workflow, all the calculation into independent tasks that were executed uh, uh, independently. And uh, when you have a lot of calculation, it's much easier uh, if you split everything and uh, 
uh, you uh, implement specialized the logic uh, to fix that particular task instead of trying to fix a big calculation that requires a lot of steps that are connected to, uh, to, to, to each other. Okay, so in the second part I would like to discuss a little bit more the uh, files we use to communicate uh, between a binit and a bitpy. We use YAML and netcdf files and each format has its own advantages and drawbacks. So YAML is mainly used for small documents in the log file for error messages or the auto parallel. It's relatively easy to implement in Forsan provided that we have uh, uh, flat uh, documents, uh, very simple, uh, uh, let's say, dictionaries. YAML was not designed for uh, big data or for performance. But still, we have seen that there are some cases in which it's nice to have some machine-readable document in the main app file for uh, implementing uh, uh, automated tests, for example. The other uh, file format is NetCDF, it's portable, we can add a lot of metadata, this is crucial for iFroput when you create a databases. We have the ETSF specification, although we had to extend it because they are not enough to cover all the cases. And another thing that I would like to stress is that if you have something that is machine readable, then it's automatically human readable because you can read it with the language and then you can present results to the human being in a nice format. So this is truly really a big advantage of machine readable format with respect to human readable only. Uh, these are the other messages that we produce in Fortran. These are the CPP macros we call to stop the code because obviously we are running in parallel so we cannot call the plain Fortran stop but we have to abort with the, the MPI library, and if we call one of these macros, what we get in the log file is this YAML document with some information about the, the function of the file and the, the, the string. Uh, this is the basic uh, mechanism used by ABPI to detect errors, but there are some uh, runtime errors that are appearing with a certain frequency, typical example, the delete max error in structural relaxation, and in this case, we use a more advanced, the more uh, robust method so we use the specialized error classes. So we just add the tag to the name of the error. And this um, macro here, we perform uh, some operation. So if a BPI finds this message here in the log file, it expects some uh, metadata, some files produced by a binit that can be used to restart. In this case, we expect to find an SDF file with the final structure that we can read hmm, so that we can regenerate a new input file with the last configuration and resubmit. Uh, okay, this is another example of the YAML document that we found at the end of the calculation. And I would like to say a few words about NetCDF files, the philosophy we used, first of all, in Fortran. A NetCDF file can be considered as a container of objects. Each object provides a NetCDF write method to dump its uh, status to file. And we use composition, so we start to collect together different objects. Uh, this is an example of Fortran code for producing the GSR file, the, ground, the file with the ground state results, in which I open the file and then I dump the, the, the data associated to the header, the ability header, then the information about the crystalline structure, the electronic energies. So I use composition. I add multiple objects to the same file, and I use the same pattern also for other files. So the, the file with the phone on DOS will have the information about the crystalline structure and then extra data related to the phone on DOS. The advantage is that one can reuse a lot of logic because you can uh, write structure, the electronic bands, and then focus just on the logic required to write the extra data uh, you need. The post-processing tool can use this metadata, and in high-level languages, you can express this composition pattern in a very simple way with mixins, and you say that GSR file has an header, has a structure, has an electron bands, and this automatically generates a lot of code for post-processing that you can expose to the uh, end user. And you also have an agnostic API because all the files containing <coughs> an events object will provide an abfile.events.plot method to plot the band structures. Okay, technical difficulties. First of all, we had a lot of problems at the level of uh, I.O., disk quota issue, when you run thousands of calculations. So what we are doing is essentially a smart I.O. mode activated by the print wave function equal to minus one, in which we print the wave function only if you are not converged. 
so that we reduce the size of the, uh, of the files on disk and we write data only if we really need it. Uh, there's also another, another option here, time limit, uh, to, that will be passed to a binit and the code will try to uh, exit uh, uh, when the time limit is approaching. Uh, another point is how to extend the test suite with ABPI in the sense that there are cases in which we have to implement extra logic to analyze the root data and find the problems. This is an, an example in which there was a change, there was a bug introduced in the, in the trunk, uh, in the phone on DOS, that was not integrated to three and atom. The reference files were updated, so Billbot was happy, uh, but fortunately ABPI detected this problem because there was a, a test in which I was integrating the DOS, all the different components, to make sure that I was getting the right results. So I discovered this bug thanks to the ABPI uh, test suite. Uh, okay, these are the parts, some, some of these topics have been already discussed in uh, uh, Fabian's uh, session, so perhaps we can skip this. And the last slide is about benchmarking with uh, Abinit and ABPI because we have so many parameters, so many algorithms. We need to create some mission scripts and test suite, all the machinery we have is not able to cope with that. And this is just an example of how I create a benchmark to analyze the strong scaling of the ground state solver for several MPI processes, a list of open MP threads, which have this for loop that is essentially creating a workflow with all these parameters, with the, an MPI manager with this configuration, and then I can submit, and at the end of the, the day, I can collect the results and uh, do some analysis. Okay, conclusions. <laughs> And I thank you for your attention. <laughs>